Hello everyone. Uh, this is the fourth lecture of our course, Triple Four Eight Five One, Advanced Communication Techniques. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about spread spectrum techniques, and there will be two parts for this lecture. This is part one. So uh, for this lecture, I followed these two particular books. Uh, first one you already know, Digital Communications by Bernard Sklar. and the next one is a new book uh, it was not included in your syllabus earlier uh, before me it but right now i have included this book as most of the resources here in this lecture were taken from these books which is wireless communications and networks by william stallings so if you want to have a better understanding of these topics then you can go through these books so let us start with this lecture First of all let us understand what is spread spectrum. A system is called or defined as a spread spectrum system if it fulfills the following conditions. First, the signal has to occupy a bandwidth which is much larger than the minimum bandwidth required to transmit the data. That is the first requirement. Then, uh, the spreading in bandwidth you know we are uh, expanding the bandwidth which is called spreading this is achieved by means of a sequence of digital bits known as spreading code or spreading sequence and this sequence will be very much independent of the actual data we want to transmit like here you see uh, here we have this input signal using this spreading code we are going to spread the bandwidth of the original signal then transmit it using our transmitter like here you see at the transmitter before transmission we have the original bandwidth b and then after this spreading obviously we will have a much larger bandwidth of bs at the channel right and at the receiver the spreaded bandwidth will be again converted to the original bandwidth which is called despreading recovery of the original data that will be accomplished by again using the same sequence right the sequence we used earlier this one the spreading code to expand or spread the signal or the bandwidth that will be used again here at the receiver to despread the signal and recover the original data so these are the requirement for a system to be called a spread spectrum system so before we uh, discuss or go into the details of how spread spectrum systems work let us talk about uh, briefly about the history of how this uh, technique was invented surprisingly enough um, this technique was invented by a hollywood actress and a pianist so hedy lamar and george enthill they together invented this technique or proposed this system in 1941 they basically described a secure radio link to control the torpedoes using this technique and for that they received a patent in 1942 but sadly enough their technique or their invention was mostly used or utilized in at that time for the contribution of war for the destruction of human kind that was the sad part of it and um this was used uh, in the initial moments of world war 2 it was used as the military guidance and communication system technique right uh, and by the end of world war 2 this technique was used for jamming resistance uh, basically the idea was if you can expand or spread the information signal over a wider bandwidth then obviously it will be difficult to jam that signal right so we are going to discuss about how this jamming resistance actually work using spread spectrum now hedy lamar she considered her invention as contribution to the war effort and for this reason she never profited from this invention of spread spectrum and after world war 2 uh, this technology was not used for any kind of communication systems uh for at least 1980s right then after that we had uh wireless mobile communication systems first generation second generation third generation like this so there this system was used and uh right now 
to this day this technique is used in most of our wireless communication techniques um, some of the examples can be given as the satellite positioning systems gps and then 3g mobile telecommunications actually uh, spread spectrum was used in 2g also but it was heavily used in 3g then also uh, wlan and bluetooth these things always use spread spectrum now in spread spectrum the first question one might ask is why should we spread the spectrum isn't it just uh, a waste of communication resource you know we already said that spread spectrum means we are just using a much larger bandwidth compared to the minimum bandwidth required for transmitting our signal so obviously we are wasting some resources that is frequency then why we are doing that the reason is we want to gain something from this sacrifice right so we want to gain signal to noise performance and for that we are sacrificing the bandwidth of our system that is the basic idea now this can be understood from our Shannon's capacity formula which was discussed over and over again uh, in the previous lectures you already know about this so in this formula you know this is uh, saying that C equals to B log to 1 plus is divided by n so c is the channel capacity the maximum amount of data we can transmit theoretically in our channel right b is the bandwidth of our system and s divided by n is the snr signal to noise ratio now from this formula we can understand that in some condition where the signal to noise ratio is very poor at that moment the only way to still secure our communication is by increasing the bandwidth right so that's why sometimes when there is a hostile environment uh, in terms of noise and interference then obviously we have to do something and that something is increasing the bandwidth right and due to this property this spread spectrum offers several benefits in our communication systems which we will discuss here briefly but in details at the later portion of our lecture now the earliest application of spread spectrum as we discussed earlier in world war ii was jamming resistance right so that was the first uh, application then by using this technique spread spectrum we can also gain immunity from various kinds of interference and multipath distortion the last one is uh, one variant of spread spectrum which is cdma you have already heard about this one code division for multiple access so this is derived from spread spectrum and here multiple users can take the same amount of bandwidth which is obviously quite larger than the minimum amount of bandwidth required to transmit the data but this larger bandwidth spreaded bandwidth is shared by multiple users and because of some unique code they use each of them there will be zero to little interference among the users that is the basic idea of code division for multiple access if you don't understand everything here don't worry because uh, for the first two cases the jamming and interference multipath distortion these things will be discussed in detail in this lecture at the later portions of the lecture after uh, we basically discuss the working principle of spread spectrum then you will understand how they actually uh, help us the advantages and for cdma we already have a lecture lined up after this one lecture five so there you will understand how code division for multiple access is uh, working uh, then let us classify the spread spectrum system so in general there are four kinds of spread spectrum system direct sequence spread spectrum or dsss frequency hopping spread spectrum or fhss these two are the most commonly used or most popular techniques and uh, and other two are time hopping spread spectrum thss and some hybrid techniques so as the first two direct sequence spread spectrum and frequency hopping spread spectrum these two are the most popular and commonly used in this lecture we are just going to discuss about these two techniques uh, how they work their working principle details will be discussed here okay let us start with direct sequence spread spectrum or dsss 
Now to understand direct sequence spread spectrum, we will consider an example where we have a BPSK data stream X of T, right? Which is here. So it has two symbols, right? This one and this one. And also we want to use the bipolar symbol representation for this one. So binary one will be represented with plus one and binary zero will be represented with minus one right like here so binary one with an amplitude of one binary zero with an amplitude of minus one in this way we are going to uh, represent our system now for the signal x of t we can see that it consists of two symbols right uh, or we can say two bits also because this is a bpsk data stream now for this one we are saying that uh, the symbol duration is tx so from here to here this is the symbol duration and this is tx and symbol rate is rx which is the inverse of tx obviously and the bandwidth is taken as bx okay so uh, this is the whole description about our signal x of t which we want to transmit now let's look at the transmitter dsss transmitter so at the transmitter first what will happen first we want to multiply our x of t the signal with a high data rate signal c of t right so you see this is our x of t and this is c of t right so this process this process of multiplying with a high data rate signal c of t is called spreading and it will spread the bandwidth of x of t as we will see very soon now the signal which we are using for spreading c of t this is called spreading sequence and in dsss a special type of code called pseudo noise or pseudo random code is used as the spreading sequence right well, this uh, particular uh, type of code pseudo random or pseudo noise code we will have a very detailed discussion in the part two of this lecture then uh, the smallest distinct unit in a spreading sequence is called chip so you see here this is our spreading sequence and it consists of kind of five bits right here one two three four five then again the same uh, sequence repeats but this smallest unit is not called bit or symbol it is called chip for spreading sequence now if you look at our spreading sequence you will see that it consists of five chips one two three four five and the chip duration is tc chip rate is rc which is inverse of tc now as compared to tx tc is much shorter right that's why this rc chip rate will be much higher compared to rx which is the symbol rate of our original signal x of t and same goes for bandwidth bandwidth will be much higher compared to bx because our chip rate or symbol rate whatever you may call that uh, this is kind of proportional to our bandwidth right that's why much larger bandwidth for this one compared to this one so what we will do now we are just going to multiply these two signals x of t with our spreading sequence c of t uh, and the resultant signal is s of t and that is done here right so you see as we are using the bipolar representation so here 1 multiplied by 1 is equal to 1 and here 1 multiplied by 0 which is minus 1 right so 1 multiplied by minus 1 which is minus 1 so in this way all the values will be uh, denoted here so s of t is this signal which is the multiplication of x of t and c of t and this resultant signal x s of t will have some kind of behavior which is the symbol duration will be exactly similar to tc so we are calling ts as the symbol duration of st which is exactly similar to tc and symbol rate rs inverse of ts is exactly equal to rc the chip rate of our sp spreading sequence and the bandwidth bs should be equal to bc which is the bandwidth of our spreading sequence 
now in this way we are going to spread the spectrum of our original signal x of t uh, which is in direct proportion to the number of chips used to encode one symbol so you see we have used five chips to encode one symbol here right so obviously our original spectrum of x of t will be expanded to a five times larger bandwidth right so in this way we can uh, expand our spectrum based on the amount of chips we are using for representing a symbol to graphically understand that uh, let us look at this uh, graphical representation so here at the top this is the original signal x of t the time domain representation and the frequency domain representation is like this the total bandwidth occupied is px right we are just taking the uh, central lobe here for determining the bandwidth then this is the spreading sequence c of t and for that the frequency domain representation looks like this with a bandwidth of bc much larger than bx and if we multiply these two signals x of t with c of t then what happens we get s of t and for s of t the representation of frequency domain can be shown like this with a bandwidth of bs which is exactly equal to bc as you can see here right so in this way actually we are just spreading our original signal to a higher bandwidth right now after getting this combined signal s of t we have to now modulate this signal to a higher frequency for transmission purpose for that we use a carrier signal cos 2 pi fct centered at frequency fc and after that the final signal is y of t after modulation so y of t should be equal to x of t multiplied by c of t multiplied by cos 2 pi fct right and here obviously x of t is the original signal c of t is the spreading sequence cos 2 pi fct is the uh, carrier signal we want for transmitting uh, it using the higher frequency and y of t is the transmitted signal so here you can see the visual representation so first of all what happens at the transmitter we have the original signal x of t using our spreading sequence c of t we multiply that to get a spread at sequence s of t and then that will be modulated using a high carrier frequency cos 2 pi fct after modulation we get the resultant signal y of t and this y of t will be transmitted using our transmitter to our channel that is the whole process of dsss transmitter now after transmission let us look at dsss receiver so at the receiver idealistically if we think that there is no noise or interference at the channel then whatever signal was transmitted using our transmitter will be received at the receiver which is y of t right so y of t will be received and after getting that y of t at the receiver we will first demodulate that to our baseband frequency just by multiplying with the same carrier frequency cos 2 pi fct so after that the resultant signal retrieved will be s of t right now this s of t will be multiplied with the exact same spreading sequence c of t we used earlier for spreading purpose at the transmitter that will be used here for despreading so how does that look like so you see after uh, demodulation we have the signal s of t here this one and that will be multiplied with the same sequence of code uh, spreading sequence c of t right here it's shown here so we will multiply this with this and if you do that you see that here 1 multiplied by 1 is equal to 1 shown here 0 which is minus 1 multiplied by minus 1 so minus 1 multiplied with minus 1 will result as 1 here also 1 1 will be 1 1 1 will be 1 and minus 1 minus 1 will be 1 so for this whole sequence we are getting 1 which is the exact result we should be getting for retrieving x of t right first one was symbol of binary one and another one was zero so here also you will see that same thing is happening minus one multiplied with my one that will result as minus one here also one multiplied with zero or minus one which is minus one so in this way all this value will be minus one so we are retrieving the 
exact signal we transmitted the original signal x of t is retrieved here that is the basic process of despreading we are using the same spreading code c of t which we used earlier at the transmitter and just by multiplying with our signal s of t we are retrieving our signal x of t right now this whole process again can be shown graphically in frequency domain also so this is our signal received signal after modulation s of t the bandwidth is b of s and after multiplying it with our sequence uh, spreading sequence we get the original signal x of t which has the original bandwidth much shorter compared to bc or even bs this is bx which is the original bandwidth for our signal x of t so this is the whole process of DSSS transmission then here reception. Now we might ask why this is happening, how we are just getting back our original signal uh, by multiplying with C of T twice, right? So to understand that, look at this uh, expression S of T multiplied with C of T. So let us expand that. So here S of T is x of t multiplied with c of t we know that right and after getting that here we have 2 c of t c of t multiplied with c of t here if i multiply c of t with itself what happens look at this one so here 1 multiplied with 1 is equal to 1 here minus 1 multiplied with minus 1 is equal to 1 1 1 is equal to 1 1 1 1 minus 1 minus 1 is equal to 1 so in this way c of t when multiplied with itself will result in a value of 1 so this whole portion will result in 1 and we are getting the original signal x of t as the result so as a result once we are multiplying with c of t at the transmitter then again at the receiver we are mul multiplying with c of t so after multiplying with c of t twice we are getting the result of 1 and as a result we are retrieving the original signal x of t that is the basic idea of spreading and despreading now let us look at the overall workflow of tsss whatever we have discussed so far so what we do first of all we have this original signal s of t, x of t which has a very short bandwidth and Compared to that, we have a much high data rate C of t as spreading sequence, which will have a higher bandwidth. And after multiplying, we are getting S of t, which has a spreaded bandwidth of Bs. And that S of t will be multiplied or modulated using a carrier cos 2 pi FCT for transmission purpose. And the resultant signal is Y of t. This Y of t will be transmitted using our transmitter and received at the receiver. We are taking the ideal case that there is no noise or interference that's why the received signal is y of t itself and we have to first demodulate it uh, from that carrier frequency so we we use that carrier frequency the same one we used before cos 2 pi fct for demodulating it to our baseband frequency and after getting that we get the result as s of t just like here right so S of t will be again multiplied with the same spreading sequence C of t for retrieving our original signal X of t. So this is the whole process for direct sequence spread spectrum. Now we are going to discuss about another kind of spread spectrum technique which is frequency hopping spread spectrum or FHSS. So in a frequency hopping spread spectrum uh, the same idea is applied which is spreading the spectrum but this is done differently so instead of just using the amount of bandwidth needed for sending our signal what we do we try to hop from frequency to frequency at fixed interval so to understand that let's say uh, for transmitting our signal we need just this amount of frequency band right so here f1 but we don't always transmit our signal using this bandwidth f1 what we do with respect to time we try to change our frequency band randomly like 
let's say for the first interval maybe f1 then maybe f5 like here you see for the first interval we have f5 we have selected as our frequency band then randomly again uh, for the next interval f8 then f3 in this way with each fixed interval we are going to hop from one frequency to another frequency so uh, that is the basic idea of frequency hopping spread spectrum and at the receiver obviously it has to be synchronized with the transmitter so whatever random sequence we are taking for hopping from frequency to frequency same sequence has to be applied or has to be known to our receiver also to pick up that signal and this random selection of frequencies for hopping this is determined by a pseudo randomly generated spreading course right so always this uh, one concept pseudo random pseudo noise or pn sequence this is coming uh, and we are going to discuss about that how they are generated how they are used in the part two of this lecture and if you look at this uh, figure you see the amount of bandwidth actually needed the minimum amount of bandwidth required for uh, transmitting our signal is actually b right but instead of that we are using a much wider bandwidth of bs that's why it can be called as a spread spectrum technique now let us understand the working principle of frequency hopping spread spectrum first of all we are going to understand uh, fhss transmission so there are two steps in transmission first is digital modulation so we have as always a input signal x of t which we want to transmit right First of all, we have to convert that to some analog form for transmission using some digital modulation techniques as we had seen earlier like FSK or BPSK. And after that, the resultant signal S of T will be centered on some base frequency F0, right? So we will move that to frequency F0. And as an example, we can say if this was BPSK modulation, then S of T can be shown as S of T is equal to A cos 2 pi F naught T. So centered on frequency F naught. So this, uh, th this is the first step. Then the next step is frequency hopping. For frequency hopping, this S of T will be again modulated to a newer frequency, which is F naught plus Fi. Here, this Fi is not fixed. That means it will change with respect to time. Uh, that is the concept of hopping time to time, right? So it will hop as the time progresses to different frequencies. So uh, how that happens, this hopping process, let us uh, discuss that. Now the rate at which this FI frequency changes, this is called the hopping rate or RH. And the duration for which uh, AFI frequency is fixed, that is called hopping period or TH. Uh, this is just the inverse of RH, right? Now, the frequency FI is selected from a range of frequencies available for transmission, right? Obviously, there are some frequencies available and based on that, uh, randomly one frequency will be selected as FI. Uh, and uh, this random selection of FI is done by a pseudo-random code generator. This pseudo-random code generator basically creates a K-bit pattern for every hopping period th um, and each of this k bit pattern can actually map to one of the two to the power k frequencies available at the frequency table if it sounds confusing uh, uh, we will see one example then it will be cleared up so uh, so basically uh, after getting this frequency uh, from this mapping right so uh, each K bit pattern will uh, map to one of the frequencies that frequency will be selected from our frequency table and then frequency table will forward that frequency fi to our frequency synthesizer uh, so that the frequency synthesizer can generate a carrier a carrier signal centered at frequency fi so let us look at one example that will clear things up so here you see we have a figure showing the example of frequency selection process this one and here the value of k is 3 so k bit pattern so 3 bits patterns are generated using our pseudo random code generators and as k is equal to 3 the total number of frequencies available is 2 to the power 3 or 8 
and so this is our frequency table right here we have eight frequencies available and each of these three bit sequences or three bit patterns can map to one of the frequencies like this and our pseudo random code generator will keep generating these signals like this and as a result uh, one by one a, this three bit sequence will select one of the frequencies like the first one is here you see this is 101 and this is mapping to our frequency 700 kilohertz right so this frequency will be forwarded to our frequency synthesizer so that we can generate a carrier signal centered at that frequency so this is the basic uh, process of frequency selection so after this selection process uh, uh, we have uh, selected one of the frequencies a5 from frequency table and that will be forwarded to our frequency synthesizer and this frequency synthesizer will generate a carrier signal centered at that frequency a5 so that signal is c of t say and cos 2 pi f i t is the carrier signal right so here you can see so pseudo random code is generated then that maps to one of the frequencies from frequency table that selects one of the frequencies f i f i will be forwarded to our frequency synthesizer and frequency synthesizer will generate one carrier frequency centered at frequency f i right so now this c of t will modulate s of t right s of t was the digitally modulated signal as we had seen earlier so carrier signal c of t will modulate the signal s of t and the resulting output will be y of t and this y of t will be centered at frequency f naught plus f i because already before this s of t was centered at frequency f naught right and c of t is centered at f i after modulation we will see that y of t is centered at frequency f naught plus f i and here f naught is obviously the best frequency uh, after digital modulation and f i is the hopping frequency which can change after each hopping period right and y of t is the resultant signal which will be transmitted using our antenna right so this is the whole transmission process in frequency hopping spread spectrum now let us look at a detailed example of this frequency hopping process in FHSS. So for this one we are taking the same example like uh, k is equal to 3 and the total number of frequencies is 2 to the power k is equal to 8. So this is the same frequency table which we had seen earlier and a pseudo noise uh, sequence generator will uh, generate this PN sequence and for each of these sequence uh, the three bit sequence you can say we will have to select one of the frequencies so in this way the first sequence the three bit pattern is one zero zero and that will map to one of our uh, frequencies right so this one maybe so 600 kilohertz for the first hopping period so that's why you see uh, we have selected f naught plus 600 kilohertz as our first hopping frequency right so in this way uh, then for the next one 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 this is 900 kilohertz so for the next hopping period we will have f naught plus 900 as our hopping frequency right so in this way randomly uh, based on the uh, sequences generated from our pseudo random code generator we will have a frequency uh, for each of the hopping periods this is the basic process of frequency hopping in frequency uh, hopping spread spectrum now uh, after uh, transmission uh, at the receiver uh, we can think of again the same idealistic uh, scenario that uh, there is no interference or noise in the channel then whatever signal was transmitted at the transmitter y of t that will be received at the receiver we are just assuming and that received signal y of t will first be de-hopped to the base frequency f naught that means whatever uh, hopping was happening that 
f i frequency has to be removed from our signal y of t right so for that we are going to generate the same pseudo random code just like at the transmitter so it has to be synchronized with our transmitter so that this one also generates the same pn sequence and that will direct to one of our frequency from frequency table we will get a fi that will uh, go to our frequency synthesizer and frequency synthesizer will generate a carrier signal at fi and after modulation of y of t using c of t we are going to remove the effect of fi right so finally what we will get we will get a signal that is centered on the base uh, frequency f naught then that d of signal s of t this one uh, centered at frequency f naught that will just be modulated again with a digital modulator like bpsk or ffsk so that we can retrieve the digital data from s of t so our digital resultant data is x of t which we want so that is the whole process of fhss receiver so uh, finally let us look at the overall workflow of frequency hopping spread spectrum so um, here we have this signal a x of t and after digital modulation we will have s of t centered at frequency f naught then after this frequency hopping uh, process uh, we get uh, c of t right uh, c of t is another uh, carrier signal centered at frequency a phi right so after this modulation we get y of t which is centered as f naught plus a phi and this a phi can change with respect to time at each hopping period we have a different a phi that is the hopping process right and after getting this y of t we can just transmit that and assuming that there is no noise or interference in our uh, channel we can uh, get y of t at the receiver and then first we will de-hop the whole signal using the same uh, hopping frequencies generated at the transmitter right so uh, this uh, this frequency hopping uh, circuit should be synchronized with this one so that the same pseudo random code gener uh, code is generated here and based on that we will have a value of fi a carrier signal c of t based on this fi and after modulation we will have a signal a a s of t which is centered at base frequency f naught right so we have just removed the effect of frequency fi and after that we will just use the basic uh, bpsk or fsk modulator centered at frequency f naught just like here and that will uh, demodulate our signal finally and we will get the digital signal x of t so that is the whole process of frequency hopping spread spectrum now uh, we are going to see one math problem so here it says that a signal occupies a bandwidth of 100 hertz when transmitted without any spreading technique and FHS system with a bandwidth of 400 megahertz is employed for transmitting the signal for the k-bit pn pattern generated in each frequency hop what is the minimum value of k in this FHSS system so for this one first of all we have to find out how many frequency bands we can have for hopping right so to understand that you see for transmitting this signal maybe we have this amount of bandwidth that is needed maybe okay so like this but for this uh, frequency hopping spread spectrum we are going to use much more wider bandwidth than this one so something like this so we will have some hopping frequencies or hopping frequency bands available for doing this so this value here this is actually 100 hertz for this example and the total bandwidth available is 400 megahertz right so what we have to find out how many bands are there to do that um, basically we have to divide uh, 400 megahertz by 100 hertz that will come out as 4 into 10 to the power 6 so we have 4 into 10 to the power 6 hopping frequency bands available for hopping right 
then after that what we have to do we already know from our previous discussion that pn generator creates a k bit pattern for each hopping period and each k bit pattern can map to one of the 2 to the power k frequencies available at the frequency table so the available frequencies at our frequency table for this system is 4 into 10 to the power 6 so which can be said equal to 2 to the power k frequency so we can say for this FHS system 2 to the power k frequencies is 4 into 10 to the power 6 and k is the value we need to find out for this example so that can be found out like this the minimum value of k should be k is equal to log 2 4 into 10 to the power 6 this value and there is a third bracket here because we have to take the smallest integer value that is not less than this value right so this value maybe comes out as 21.67 something like this but as this is not an integer value we have to take the next value that is integer right the smallest integer value that is not less than this value which is 22 bits so for each of the hopping period we have to generate a sequence of bit that is 22 bit long as pn sequence and that will map to one of the frequencies from our frequency table right and our frequency table has 4 into 10 to the power 6 frequencies so in this way it will it will work i hope you understand the whole procedure that's all for this lecture thank you